All right, well, good afternoon and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today for our second program for National Family History Month. Um, today's presenter is Carla Zamask, and she is the technology manager for the history department at Princeton University and has decades of experience incorporating the ever-changing technological landscape in her own genealogical pursuits. Carla holds a master's in information studies and a certificate in digital asset management from the Rutgers University School of Communication and Information Studies. She also has various techno technology certifications and has been published in the Chicago Genealogist. So welcome, Carla. Thank you so much for speaking to our audience today about how technology can be used to solve a variety of genealogical mysteries, and you'll be um, showcasing um, how how that has helped you in, in your research. Um, we will be taking your questions at the end of Carla's presentation today, but please feel free to submit them at any time using the Q&A or the chat feature in the Zoom dashboard. Um, Carla has graciously provided me with a copy of the presentation slides as a handout. I will be uploading that to the chat once we get underway. Um, if you have problems downloading the file from the chat, don't worry, it'll be available as an attachment in the follow-up email that I will be sending out. Um, this program is being recorded, so look out for that as well in that follow-up email. Um, there will be a survey at the end of the program, so we ask if you have time, please complete the survey. We always appreciate any feedback that you can give us. Um, and if you want some more information about how to incorporate technology into your own genealogy research, um, you can visit Carla's website, ancestortech.com, at the web address on the screen there. And again, I will send that link out um, in the chat once we get underway. The last thing that I have for you is just a brief overview of the Zoom dashboard. This is what the dashboard should look like if you're using a PC or a Mac. If you're using a mobile device, the dashboard may look a little bit different, but all of the features will still be there. In the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see your audio settings. Here you can check to make sure that if you're using an external listening device, like a headset or earbuds, that it's connected properly there. At any point during the presentation, if you run into any issues, there is a raise hand button here. You can click on that, that'll alert me and I will send you a message in Zoom and hopefully be able to resolve, resolve any problems that you're having. And as I mentioned before, if you do have any questions, you can use the Q&A or the chat buttons there to send them to us, um, and we'll be happy to address them at the end of Carla's presentation. So that is everything that I have for you. So it's my pleasure to turn it over to Carla now. Well, Andrew, thank you very much. And you, I just want to do one more check. You can hear me OK, correct? Yep, sounds good. Thank you. Uh, so thank you. Thank you to uh, New Jersey State Library for inviting me to come speak today as part of Family History Month. And thank you, especially Regina and Andrew, for all their help in this. And thank you to all of you who are out there somewhere, but wherever you are, I hope you enjoyed today's talk. Uh, and walk away with some new information for your genealogical journeys. With that, I'm going to share my screen. Get my slides going for you. And if that is not showing, let me know. Looks good. Thank you. So uh, in the time that we have today, I'm gonna take you on a whirlwind tour at about 30,000 feet over the technological landscape uh, in the context of my own genealogical journey to so far to date. Uh, if, if you have an interest in deeper dives, I, I suggest you refer to my website as Andrew pointed out, and it's also will be on the handout slide deck uh, where you can find more information about the deeper dives that I offer in my series of courses and where else I'll be teaching. So my own genealogical journey began, as probably many of yours did, uh, with a grade school assignment uh, way, way, way back in the analog age uh, where I was to build a family tree uh, and get information to build that tree, at least back to my great-grandparents on both sides of my family. 
My mother, an avid genealogist herself, took great delight in this uh, assignment and right away got on the phone, started writing letters. Uh, we started visiting people or going to the library to look up information. Again, this was all in the analog age. And she helped me hand draw the tree uh, on a big piece of cardboard using nothing more than a ruler and some markers. And I helped color code the generations. Uh, it, this was really the moment that sparked my interest from that point forward. And I think partly because I'm born so late in my family, I am the last of five <laughs> that are spread out many years. So uh, for me to learn about all of these people, grandparents even, that I never knew because they were gone long before I was born. This just really got the genealogy bug in me. And that ultimately, what that has culminated to these days is the ancestor tech concept and the series of classes that I offer take, taking those deeper dives into various categories of technologies and resources for today's genealogy in all of these dis different categories. As I was introduced, you may have noticed that my name is Carla Zamask. It ends with the K. Uh, there have been, uh, it's just been a lifetime of, of people putting the I back on the end of my name. Uh, I don't personally have a problem with that, but the legal world does. And I actually have had to redo mortgage papers, loan papers, car loans, that sort of thing, just because that little I uh, sneaks back in there. And that's normal because most of the time, a name that ends in, especially O-W-S-K, is going to be followed by an I or a Y. Um, but in the digital age, it makes it even worse because it, if you send me an email and there's an I on the end of that name, it just won't get to me. The age old question that was always put to us in my family was, well, what kind of name is that? Well, one reaction always had been, we are German, not Polish. And given that my family settled in Chicago on the north side, which is very Polish, um, there was likely in the earlier days and perhaps my great grandparents' days, that competition of immigrant labor and sometimes wanting to, to appear, wanting to be known as German was supposedly more valuable possibly than wanting to be known as any other immigrant group. Uh, other, other family uh, responses that were handed down was it's a border name or it's Prussian. Uh, neither one of those made any sense to me when I was a child, but they were said over and over again. Now we have in the various lines of my father's family, we have those with the I and those without. Um, now, as far as I can tell, my branch lost the I, starting with my grandfather. Uh, he was born with an I, <clears throat> but he was buried without one. And my own father and his siblings were born uh, and buried without the I. So it is our legal name. We don't know <clears throat> why my grandfather chopped it off. It could have been related to the sentiment of not wanting to uh, be mistaken as Polish, even though, as you will see as I go on, the name certainly comes from Poland. Uh, some in other lines actually uh, were so frustrated with the name that they actually ditched it completely and took their mother's maiden names because they were simpler, Fisher, Gibson, etc. In any case, my last name, my father's name is, is a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because it's not a very common name, but it's a curse because it can be spelled, misspelled, and, and just mutilated in so many different ways. As I started preparing for this talk, uh, I did a, a quick sort of um, review of where, when the digital age sort of overlapped with my um, growing passion with genealogy and my ability to actually uh, take it up more in my life. Because certainly uh, starting with the grade school assignment, that is where my uh, interest got ignited. 
And of course, moving through high school, college, and into getting adult life started in my 20s, which included shifting my life to New Jersey, um, certainly there wasn't a lot of bandwidth or time to actually do genealogy, especially considering it was not in the digital age yet. It was not as easy as sitting down at the computer. So I would generally keep up with my mother's work. Uh, she was retired by then and uh, doing a lot of the continuing research. And then when my dad passed away, I took an even greater interest in gathering oral histories from my mother and from others and making sure I knew where my mother's files were. This area right here around the 2000 mark is right when I started working in support, uh, offering technical support to the historians at Princeton University. And it coincides beautifully with the dawn of the genealogical digital age, the ancestries, the family searches, uh, all kinds of other state specific portals and then country specific portals, tools, software, hardware, et cetera. And it all just explodes after that into the time when I picked up the charge from my mother as she uh, slowly lost her memory to dementia in the 2010s. So it's just sort of interesting to see that progression and that overlap. I was in the right place at the right time. My journey uh, that I will talk about today uh, culminated in an article, as Andrew mentioned, that I submitted to the Chicago Genealogist, which is the Chicago Genealog Genealogy Society's journal. Uh, and that was not my initial, my original goal. I didn't set out to write and submit an article. That came sort of at the end after putting everything together. If you would like to read that article, it is available online through that link that also is in your, in your handouts. My research focused on Chicago, Upper Midwest in general, Michigan, Western New York State, Poland, Germany, Russia, and what was Prussia. So even though that's what I will mostly talk about today, you will, you potentially will see the, the benefit of the same tools, even if you may be researching other areas. Uh, I think the thing that disappointed me the most, or surprised me the most in, in submitting that article was when I first got the, the copy of the actual published article, I was immediately kind of shocked that, oh my gosh, this is only six pages long. And four of those pages, only four are content or narrative where the other two are all citations. And I thought, how could it have taken me 10 years to write six pages? But that is the labor of love. Uh, there were just so many things that I needed to go looking for both online and offline that uh, it really wasn't until the very end as I pulled everything together for my particular research question. What I learned along the way in terms of technology was that it's more important to find a tool or use a tool that fits your specific task instead of uh, using a tool that just simply distracts you. And I'll say more of that as we go along and take a quick look at some of the tools that are out there. Also, I think it's important to know and remember that not everything is found online and not everything that's online is indexed. Sometimes you do actually have to go to these locations or reach out to them. And then finally, what I learned is genealogy road trips are a lot of fun. So one of the most common questions I get is, well, where do you begin in your genealogical journey? Uh, and for those of you who already have begun and, and are in various phases of your journey, you may realize, like I do, that there are many places you begin, and you begin many times. It depends on what person or time or event you may be focusing on. But where do you begin overall? If you're just really starting out, the best place to begin is usually with what you know, usually with you, and then work backwards. And what I always suggest is that you work backwards until you hit a gap in information. And perhaps that becomes a question you want to pursue. So for me, back at that grade school assignment, my mother's side uh, was very 
quickly filled in. She had a lot of information or in subsequent years filled it in even more with so much more information. My father's side, however, always ended with my paternal great grandparents. And I just, I always found that so strange. And specifically with this, my paternal great grandparent, but this supposed character, John von Martin Zamoski. I mean, he sounded so important. Was he a land baron? Uh, where did he come from? We didn't know. And wasn't there anybody above him? So this was always the mystery in my mind since I was a child. So when I got old, into my 30s and 40s, this was where I wanted to pick up um, the research. So the other thing I suggest is that once you find your question or figure out what you do know, you also want to look around to what others might know, cousins, uh, even family friends, uh, uncles, aunts, etc., or what others might have in their collections. So my, I, I wound up inheriting uh, the bulk of my mother's analog research, which is just amazing. And so I have a lot of handwritten notes from my mother. And because of that, I was able to get back into touch back in touch with some family members that she had collaborated with uh, so that I could pick up where she left off instead of reinventing the wheel, basically. Uh, and in looking through all of this information, uh, I could start to identify where the gaps in information were. And that helped me then formulate a question to pursue, which then also turns into an action item. Now, uh, one of the first uh, two people that I was able to reconnect with from my mother's research were two cousins from my father's side. Uh, they are actually much older than I am, but again, I'm born late in the generations, but we share John von Martin as our great grandfather. And one is cousin Ernie, who uh, sat and talked with my mother at one point, and she took these handwritten notes uh, ab about family lore that, you know, he had. He had moved to Michigan, Big Rapids. He um, was living with a woman there, uh, that he was shot going home, uh, or that he was a stagecoach driver in Poland. And that one really surprised me because I thought, well, wait a minute, I thought we weren't Polish. But I still don't have an answer for that one. Uh, but he also then years later, when I got in touch with him, he he filled in a lot of these stories that much more and he has an amazing memory. So I kept all of the emails uh, and turned them into PDFs so that, that they are kind of a, an oral history for me where he tells more about the story of how he understood that Martin um, moved to Michigan uh, to live with a woman and her daughter uh, and that he apparently came home drunk one night uh, and climbed into the window and the lady of the house shot and killed him. So I, there were, you know, were some morsels of truth there, but I had to go in search of the actual evidence to prove or disprove this family story. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say on that was that uh, yeah, the the only other thing I knew about John von Martin or Martin was that uh, he had disappeared to Michigan in the early 1900s, uh, leaving his first wife, Augusta, my paternal great-grandmother, behind in Chicago with seven children. So what did others have? So another cousin I was introduced to through my mother's research and collaboration was cousin Tom. Uh, although cousin Tom is not a blood cousin of mine, he's married to a blood cousin, also sharing John von Martin as our great grandparent. Uh, t cousin Tom, however, was embracing the technological, technological landscape much earlier than I was. And he really started embracing a lot of the early software for tree building uh, and started using Family Tree Maker. And that really was sort of the impetus of me later on deciding to use the same so that we could collaborate. Uh, but he also, as he noted in his family tree, he was the one who kept noting this, this Martin as John Von Martin, taken from uh, a christening certificate that is framed in Tom's home. 
uh, certainly behind glass to be protected. Uh, so that was one of the first uh, leads that I wanted to go after. So after looking around at everything that I had from my mother and that the cousins had and so forth, uh, I started listing out where the gaps were. So John Von Martin, is this really John Von Martin is his real name or is it just Martin? So that turns into an action item. Get the cousin to take a picture of the christening certificate, find someone who can translate it. Uh, Martin disappeared to Michigan. Question, why Michigan? Where in Michigan? Action, find census records. Could do that online now. Uh, Martin died in Michigan. Okay, where is he buried? Action, find death records. Find cemetery records. Could do that online now. Martin was shot and killed. Whatever that the truth is in that myth, that much I had to park for right now because uh, that's a difficult one to find unless I can find some account in a newspaper somewhere. So that I'm still searching for that smoking gun. So starting with that certificate, uh, Cousin Tom did send me some pictures, but was too concerned, rightly so, about taking it out of the frame and from behind the, the glass. So he took it uh, digitally uh, with his smartphone from just standing in front of the certificate framed on the wall, uh, which did not come through great at all. Uh, so I can't really zoom in and see the fine detail that I would if, if we could find someone to take this to a conservator of sorts who could carefully remove this and scan it in high res, or we could see so much more detail. Um, but for the meantime, it was sort of enough because I too could see, and you probably can't see on, on this uh, screenshot, that it does look like it says Albert Heinrich, that's the child, the baby, <clears throat> uh, the first child of Martin and Augusta. It does look like it says Albert Heinrich, son of Martin Zamoski and Augusta. Now, at the time, I had just started working in, in the history department, and I thought, oh, well, I'm surrounded by historians. Let me see if I can ask one of them to translate for me. And, and he did, and he said, that's not John, that's son. It's S-O-H-N, it's German for son. Well, these days, uh, we have AI all over the place. Uh, and we have so many transcription and translation options. Uh, and so for me, it, even though this is not a high quality, high res image, I was able to bring this into something like Google Lens as early as 2017. And sure enough, it translated it the same way. This is Albert, a son of Martin. So question answered, it's Martin Zamoski. It is not John von Martin Zamoski and many other translation and transcription options out there that I invite you to explore. Uh, a lot of the historians use Transcribus. I have not exactly played with that yet, <clears throat> but these are links that you can follow to learn more about what's out there and there is more coming out all of the time. Of course, then also uh, the tree building options begin to really expand in the digital age at this time. And as I mentioned, my cousin Tom was already embracing a lot of this. Uh, so I was learning from him. But these days, we have not only uh, software options to install locally on your own device, uh, we also have online tree building options in the cloud of viewer. Uh, we also have options then to synchronize between those. So this is making collaboration a lot easier as well. Uh, and collaboration becomes especially important uh, as many different family members might start making these digital trees. Why should any one of you duplicate the effort and so when it came time for me to try and pull what I was learning about the Zamoski side of the family into the bigger tree, uh, I had to look to cousin Tom and then ultimately my sister Ellen, who also started building on my mother's side of the family. And, and nowadays there are all these capabilities to do split of branches off of digital trees and merge those branches with another tree, uh, just all kinds of possibilities in the digital realm now. And then of course, there's the online searching. Uh, and I think it's uh, 
beneficial to have a base understanding of how online searching works, whether it's a free form search in a search engine or through a search portal with a specific interface for you to use. Uh, it really comes down to indexing. And I mentioned in the beginning that, you know, not everything is online. Uh, but also not everything that's online is indexed and index is what makes it possible to to find things by by word keyword by uh, string of characters a number of different search parameters if it's not indexed it's not as easy to find so that's basically what all of the search portals uh, are built on but nowadays we also have a lot of other uh, uh, technology in the mix such as AI, which I'll touch on a bit more in a moment. And also it's important to know that by now it's really not all about Ancestry.com. Yes, Ancestry and Family Search were out there in the front and they really grew rapidly, but there are so many portals out there now all over the world. Uh, so no matter what areas you're researching or time periods, you should be able to find something. Uh, and I encourage you to check a Sassy Jane genealogy uh, blog as she writes on uh, these matters quite a lot and goes into specific portals that are out there, state specific, country specific, etc. And then of course, no matter where you're searching online, it, it's helpful to know a little bit about these, but again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this here, but especially if you're using search engine searches, I tend to go back and forth quite a bit between a structured form like Ancestry or Family Search and that of just Google or Bing or whatever search engine. Uh, your, your operators can be so helpful to you in narrowing down results. Uh, and again, Zamask being a, a blessing and a curse, or Zamaski if you want to say, uh, there are times when there are all kinds of different letters used in the middle or even at the end. So sometimes I need to use the wildcard asterisk, which is basically saying, I know there are letters or characters in here, I just don't know what they are or how many, uh, versus the question mark, which is saying, I know a letter is in here, I just don't know what it is. Uh, most of the search forms these days do this sort of uh, narrowing down for you by checkboxes and whatnot, but these are some good tactics to keep in mind when you're doing freeform searches in search engines. So as I mentioned, if we look at the, the familiar family search search form and uh, Ancestry is not too different than this, um, they do a lot of this uh, narrowing down work or, or operator functionality uh, within their form, um, but to different uh, degrees. And if you're familiar with the family search form, of course, you have this checkbox and if you check that off, it's basically on or off. So you're saying it's restricted to whichever, if you leave it unchecked, it may come up with a lot of different variations of that name. If you check it off, it's gonna only show you that exact spelling. So that's a little bit more restrictive than an ancestry where you have the sliding bars and you can set a degree of exactness or broadness uh, because it is very helpful to, to do your search is going back and forth between very broad searches and, and narrower searches and broad and narrow and broad and narrow, especially if you have uh, a name that is sort of a blessing and curse. Uh, so as we talk about ancestry though, another thing you may find, because if you, if, if you have a family search account, I highly encourage you to have one, it's free on familysearch.org uh, and you can search there for free and you can be part of the collaborative family tree. You just can't have a private family tree there. But uh, Family Search actually has an amazing um, resource, a uh, help resource in Wikipedia that can help you learn more about your specific research areas and other resources that are out there. A lot of times though, when you're searching in Family Search, you may come across something that actually belongs to Ancestry. And maybe you're feeling sort of hesitant to commit to a subscription to Ancestry at this time. There are ways to search Ancestry for free or to use Ancestry for free. And one of the most important ways, and I'm hoping most of you know this since I'm hoping a good deal of you are members of a local library or your New Jersey State Library, is that 
most libraries have an Ancestry Library edition. And so if you go into your library, you can use this and you can search the full catalog for free. What you can't do in there is build a tree uh, or um, I can't remember what the other uh, limitation is, but you can definitely search the whole catalog and you can take notes or, or capture that information that you find, um, perhaps download it, uh, and then incorporate that somewhere else where you are keeping that information. There's also a guest account which basically lets you set up a free trial account in Ancestry. Uh, you're restricted in what you can search, only the free catalogs, but you can build a tree. And then when you do decide you want a subscription, then that just becomes your full account. So between Ancestry Library Edition and a guest account, you can pretty much benefit, get the benefit of Ancestry catalogs without having to commit to the subscription. And I give you a link in your slides uh, for instructions on how to set up that guest account. So I mentioned this, and I'm sorry, I forgot, I missed, I reordered some of the slides here. But yes, in Family Search and, and Ancestry and most portals, they usually have a really robust help center to give you guidance on how best to use their form, how to get the most out of searching in their portal. Uh, but they also have a great deal of uh, community resources, uh, message boards and things like that, where other people might be researching the same area or the same time period or the same brick wall. Uh, Family Search in particular, I've always been impressed with this. Their research wiki is amazing. Uh, if you use Family Search for nothing else, I suggest this, where you can search uh, by, by region or by topic. Uh, and it will give you pages of uh, links off to specific resources that you can look into for that or historical resources. It is just such a wonderful uh, portal to use. And that's one of the places I usually start uh, when I'm starting uh, down a new area of research. And of course, there's so many others out there by now, um, some free, some paid, some free for time and then paid. Uh, these are some of the most common ones that you know, but also there are digital library portals. And again, check with your library. Uh, they will know about these. There are map portals, uh, portals specific to certain genealogical areas of research or historical research. One of the other places you can find an amazing clearinghouse of information on specific portals by category is the Cindy list, Cindy's list. Highly encourage you to explore this. Topics or categories are anything from researching women uh, in a specific time period in a specific region uh, to uh, specific challenging research areas, African-American enslaved people's research. It's just a wealth of information and she's adding to it all the time. So going back to my own journey uh, and how I used a lot of this or learned a lot about it as I was going along. Of course, I ran into a lot of other names, Zamoski names that I was researching as well. And like I said, a lot of times I had to go back and forth between Ancestry Family Search and Google uh, and then try and open, you know, try searching broadly first. But a lot of times in Google, that would just give me an overwhelming amount of hits, over 300,000 to search on a John G. Zamoski, uh, because basically it was looking for everything that would give a John, a G, and a Zamoski versus just the string all together. So when I finally narrowed that down using quotes, you can see it cut it down to 6,000 some. Uh, and then I was able to find resources or other portals where I might find more information about this person. Likewise, I could eliminate things that I didn't want to have come up in my hits, especially <clears throat> there were two things that always came up. And one was Zamoski Food Specialties, which is still in existence in New York State. I have yet to, I have reached out to them a couple times, but uh, that's a story for another time. Uh, and this Cardinal uh, Zamoski in, in Poland. So these kept sort of getting in the way of what I was exactly looking for. And again, you can see by using operators to eliminate or to add things, uh, you can change, vastly change your results and narrow that down. 
And in terms of general research strategies, it's also important to remember that it's not just a matter of looking forward or looking backward in generations or looking st strictly for that person's uh, information, but you may have to uh, look around that person. And these are called uh, sideways researches or sideways searching cluster research, fan club, family associates and neighbors. Very important to try this, uh, especially in terms of certain brick walls. Again, I would go back to enslaved people. Uh, a lot of times this is exactly the kind of searching you need to start doing to try and find information about your ancestor through those who may have been on the periphery of their lives. And also I su strongly suggest uh, especially in this digital age, uh, especially if you have a very busy schedule, that you come up with a way to do a research log for yourself. It is so easy, as I'm sure you all know, to get lost down that rabbit hole. You get online, you think, oh, I have an hour, let's go see if I can, you know, poke around and find some more information on uncle so-and-so or whatever the person is you're focused on. But if you don't have an exact question you're after, like, okay, I'm going to spend an hour looking for Martin Zamoski's death certificate in Michigan. I'm not going to go chasing other rabbits. Um, but it's tempting to capture something you may have found. Uh, and so this is where with a research log, you can make notes of that as you're going along and perhaps even capture URLs you wanna go back to or other hits that came up and your search strings. Um, so for me, I tend to use um, a couple of different tools. Something as simple as a spreadsheet can really do it for you where you just sort of log Log yourself in on the spreadsheet at such and such a date. Uh, here is where I'm searching, the question I'm focused on, here what I, here's what I found, and then you leave notes for yourself on what to go back to the next time you sit down so that you don't start all over again. Another tool I use, and these uh, tools are being embraced more and more in the genealogy world. They're just uh, sort of more robust organizational tools and they can help you stay organized in various ways. And they're just basically digital notebooks. Evernote is a popular one, um, and Microsoft now has OneNote, uh, and there are a lot of other ones out there. Um, they can take screen captures from a website or uh, just clip articles. Uh, so it's and it, it's cloud-based, so it's kind of nice that wherever you are, if you suddenly find something online, you can just clip it uh, right into your notebook and not have to worry about finding that piece of paper where you made that note later on. So, my odyssey then uh, starts picking up where my mother left off. And as I begin to do all of this online research, uh, especially using all those wild cards, et cetera, I do a lot of Google searches. And at one point, I started getting these results for a Zamoski Road up in Mile, Michigan. And I thought, well, this can't be a, a a coincidence i i really must go and then the other irony of it was it did have a vowel but it has an e on the end so the first thing i had to do was figure out where martin was buried i was going to have to work my way backwards because uh i had no idea why there would be a zamoski road up in Mayo, michigan which is all the way up north i'll show you maps in a moment uh so i was lucky enough to get in touch with a county clerk uh, in the Big Rapids area, and lucky enough that she too was interested in genealogy. Uh, but here again, this is where not everything is online. This is online now because I uploaded it to my family tree and ancestry. But in the de this death certificate, it it names it states his cause of death as acute dilation of the heart, which I think uh, is equated to congenital or not congenital uh, congestive heart failure he was in his 70s i think 72 or 73 um but this pretty much dispels the myth that he was killed by a gunshot uh so one of those questions now answered he he might have been shot at one point but um we could now say he wasn't killed by that uh so in any case this person helped me uh track down more information about where he could be buried because we weren't finding him in any of the cemeteries in that area. Turns out she found through uh, the certificate here notes that he was buried by 
his burial was paid paid for by Macosta County, which means uh, that he was poor. Uh, and then we found out further information uh, about a house that he had big rapids uh, and, and a second wife, etc. So with all of that much known, I said, I have to take a road trip. Uh, so any time at that point when I would go to visit my family in Chicago, I would make a road trip out of it and make all these stops, research stops. And I started blogging about these road trips, uh, partly for my own sake as a part of a research log so I could remember what I was finding, what I was after, but also to keep my family posted uh, for them to follow as I was making my way around. Uh, and also just, and I, I also started using uh, a lot of mapping tools at that time, mostly again, to map my own trip uh, for people to track me. But then I started mapping out the Martin, the what I called the Martin Trail. So it, as I started blogging things, uh, I would then also plot those areas on the map and plot them uh, in relation to the different events that I was finding in the timeframes. There are a lot of different mapping tools out there these days, simple to complex. There's Google Maps, Bing, MapQuest, on the more complex side, but really robust, ArcGIS, QGIS, some free, some paid, some free to paid, but they're a great way uh, of visualizing uh, distances between locations, proximity of those fan clubs, travel times, of course, street view, satellite view, all of those things that you're familiar with. They're really great visualization tools for historical research as well. So again, anytime I found new information, I would chart it on the map. And also what is really nice is that if you start collecting addresses or even just place names and people names, you don't have to manually create these place markers, you can upload addresses in batches from a spreadsheet and Google and other mapping uh, tools will plot those for you. So I made my first stop in Michigan, the Lansing Library, sorry, I skipped, <clears throat> um, because I had been told um, as I called around doing research in Michigan that this was a premier library for Michigan genealogy especially. And while I didn't find much about Martin here, I did learn so much more about the region, about land settlement uh, and that sort of thing. But the, the librarian here, when I told her the areas I was trying to find information about, she said, you're going to have to go to those areas. You will not find that information online. And so I did, and I met up with uh, this county clerk out of uh, Big Rapids. And by then she was able to track down where Martin's last house was in Big Rapids with his second wife, uh, who mysteriously disappears from record. I'm still trying to trace this one down, but she disappears out of the picture um, at some point around 1932. And that's when he loses that house to a sheriff's sale and Big Rapids, just so you know, is, is right in the middle of the state, uh, and Mayo is up here to the north. And this is where Martin started out with first wife Augusta, and so he made his way all through Michigan because he also lived in Detroit at one point. In any case, it was after uh, the house in Big Rapids uh, was lost in the sheriff's sale that Martin, uh, was then sent or, or went to poorhouse. He wound up in the poorhouse. And I remember thinking when I heard that or read that, I thought, I thought that was always just a, a saying. I didn't know that was a real thing. <laughs> and so I actually learned a lot about poor houses and poor farms. This one was actually a poor farm. But at one point there was a fire in the main infirmary. And so a lot of the, the inmates, as they're called, were transferred to this actual building. So this county clerk took the time to show me all of these sites, and it was really quite amazing. Uh, but ultimately, what, what we learned is that Martin uh, was buried in a potter's field, an unmarked grave, and that's why I could not find him.
Now, this is not a happy ending by any means. In fact, I write in the article that, you know, this is a rags to rags story, unfortunately, but I find that interesting. Uh, I don't always, I don't need to know what president I may have been related to or king or anything like that. I find these kinds of stories a lot more interesting to write about. They're, they're just so intriguing. Um, and, and then also to, to learn more about the people that, that survived such hard times. I, I really find that the, the most interesting. I'm gonna speed ahead here. I can see my clock counting down. So uh, that was road trip 2011. And I learned that, uh, okay, Martin didn't die of a gunshot wound, but now I needed to go up to Mayo and figure out what was up there. And that's where Zamoski Road is. So of course I had to get a picture of me and my street sign, but it was, you know, I found a vowel, but not the vowel I expected. And then I wound up finding more goats as I blogged more and more. I found an, uh, records up there of a uh, Fred Zamoski, and that's who owns Zamoski Road. It was his farm uh, and his wife, uh, Justine and children, uh, a, a lot of Zamoskis with an E on the end I had never heard of before. So I kept blogging about all of this, putting the timelines together. I also, while I was in Mile, uh, did some research in the dusty old archives there and found land deeds uh, where Martin was buying and selling land and listing himself as a widower, despite the fact that he had an ex-wife and seven children in Chicago. This is a 19, oh, well, this is 1910. Uh, so as I'm blogging uh, about all of this, I actually get someone writing into the blog asking, who are you and why are you blogging about our great grandparents? So enter the cousins from the line of Fred Zamoski, Fred Zamoski, who is Martin's older brother. And why did Martin go to Michigan? Where did he go? When he got kicked out of Chicago, he went to live with his brother, Fred, in Mile, Michigan. And then he married a woman, and then he moved to Detroit, and then they moved to Rapid, Big Rapids, and you know the rest from there. So answered a lot of questions by meeting these cousins. Uh, but these cousins, oh, well, this was also interesting, is that they, uh, in talking to them, uh, they said they had always heard stories about this this brother Martin, who was notorious, I guess, uh, and but never knew that he had a family, much less that he had a family in Chicago. And when I asked them why they have an E on the end of their name, their response was because we're German, not Polish. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. Two very separate lines of Zamoski family that know nothing about each other. And that got handed down through all the generations. <laughs> so this trip winds up oh, and becoming another trip uh, to meet those cousins in person. And they have a lot of different materials, a lot of different uh, archival information, family Bibles. They even have a military certificate uh, of, of Fred Zamoski's honorable discharge from the Kaiser's army. Uh, so, and of course, all of this results in a lot of digital files. And I had to come up with some way of making sure that I was going to keep that all organized. Uh, and then, of course, it gives me a lot more keywords also to use in doing my searches. Uh, and, and I believe it was through Cindy's list that I discovered that uh, if you're doing research in this area of the world, because one of the things about this uh, certificate was, is, okay, I, I could have uh, this name, this t this town name, and this town, this county, but it's from Prussia. Now I know what Prussia is. Uh, so it doesn't exist anymore. It's in Poland now. So Kartenmeister, if you're doing research in this area of the world, uh, highly recommend you look into this. Uh, you can basically plug in what was a German or Prussian town name, and it will give you back the current day Polish name of the town and coordinates on a Google map. These are the kinds of things that you can find while you're going along these journeys. But mapping has just been an incredible part of my journey. Uh, again, here you can see exactly where Fred Zamoski is from here via his military certificate. 
Uh, and later on, I find out that so is younger brother John, uh, and that Martin seems to be the middle brother. So if Fred was born here and John was born here, then perhaps it's safe to say that Martin was born here, even though we'll probably never find a birth certificate on him. Uh, also then going on to map out other Zamoskis as I find them in census records or immigration records and begin to recognize the similar names from East Prussia. And now that I know how to chart them, I'm trying to explore uh, other branches of the family and to see if there could be a relation. Uh, the other thing you can do, oh, and another resource I highly recommend to you is that you look at David Rumsey historical maps. Uh, it was there that I was able to find a historical map and overlay that in Google Earth. And this is another thing you can do in a lot of these mapping tools. It's, it's rather complex, but it's, it's doable, ArcGIS, et cetera. And you can compare in layers what, especially in an area where borders change, that's an interesting exercise to do. But of course, all of this in the digital realm gets really messy, so you do have to come up with a way to keep yourself organized. Uh, you have to become your own digital asset manager as well as your own project manager uh, and come up with ways that you're going to organize things, how you will name them using naming, best naming practices. You have to follow your rules. Uh, and I'll emphasize here just in brief how important it is to get serious about your citations. Uh, and, and there are free forms out there for keeping track of citations and photo inventories and that sort of thing. I give you some lists here. Do take advantage of them. The one thing I regretted in ultimately writing my article is um, I did not do a good job of noting certain citations like those land records up in Mayo, Michigan, uh, because I believe recently there was a fire uh, that may have destroyed a lot of those records, and I did not note uh, how those books were organized or any of that. So, um, it, like your mother used to say, eat your peas, mark your citations down as you go. And again, this is where uh, digital logs like Evernote and things like that can help you in quickly grabbing those. So uh, in closing, um, what I, like I said, I did not set out to, uh, to submit an article to a journal, but uh, when, when the Chicago Genealogical Society put the invitation out uh, to members, I thought, well, this would be an interesting exercise and I really wanted to write the family narrative anyway. So while originally it was meant to be a narrative that I would write out for the cousins, uh, it became a bigger project, but this was a nice way to share it with everyone. And, and I hope to do more of these because my next big question mark is Augusta. And so she's gonna be my next genealogical journey. And with that, uh, I thank you very much. And I, I hope you uh, got you know enough interesting uh, tidbits out of the whirlwind tour and again, if you would like to take a deeper dive into any of those areas, please do visit my website uh, or you can sign up for my mailing list following this link, which is again on your slide deck. But with that, I'll hand it back over to Andrew and for any questions, thank you. Thank you, Carla, uh, fantastic presentation. <clears throat> um, if anybody does have questions, please feel free to submit them using the Q&A or the, the chat features and we'll be happy to address them. Um, do you know of any free online search databases for crematorium records? That's an interesting question. Um, offhand, no, but I will tell you that, and, I, and Cindy, look at Cindy's list, because uh, I know there was discussion recently in one of the groups about funeral home records coming online. Uh, through various projects. I hadn't thought about crematorium. That's a really good question. I'm going to have to look at that myself. I'm sorry I don't have a quick answer for you. Uh, but I, again, I would check with Cindy's, check through Cindy's list and see if she has a growing category for funeral records or related. Where do you see the future of technology with AI and genealogy research? 
uh, well, so, you know, I didn't really touch on the AI part that much, especially in relation to um, the latest, you know, craze with uh, chat GPT and the like. Um, but the AI part actually has been around for a long time, and there are two different types of AI. There's predictive and there's generative. The predictive has been around for a long time. It's the shaky leaf on the ancestry tree. You know, I think this person might be related to you. Uh, or that Google thing that pops up when you're you know, shopping around for something that says, you might like this, All right? That's predictive. The new chat GBT realm, this is generative. So this is you give it information and ask it to transform it for you in some way. Um, I think there's gonna be a lot of that in the future, uh, but in some really interesting ways. I have been following some, some blogs and things that are discussing how people are using these new tools. The best example I can give you is, for instance, uh, in the predictive AI, you might ask something like a search engine, uh, can you find some good chicken soup recipes for me? And it might give you a list of websites that have recipes. But in something like ChatGPT or Bard, uh, you can say, look, here are some ingredients. Can you make chicken soup out of it? And, and it will literally, because I tried this, it will literally compose author a recipe for you down to the measurements, the time to cook and all that sort of stuff. So uh, it generates for you. And the ways some people are using this for genealogy is to help analyze data that they find. Uh, and especially I think in relation to sideways searching to feed it data of, uh, let's just say several, several pages of census data where you're trying to find out, are there some relationships here in this neighborhood uh, where it would take you probably a long time to sift through that. You can ask ChatGPT to analyze this for you in specific ways and, and spit you back the, the results of that. So that's one of the places where I see a lot of this going. I don't have any more questions. It looks like you, you did a fantastic job. <laughs> um, for somebody who's who's Thank getting you. started, who, who might be a, a beginner, what would you recommend in terms of, uh, of some of the, the technology resources to, to get started with? I highly recommend creating a family search account for yourself. Again, it's free and you do not have to build the tree in there. The tree in there is public, so I understand not wanting to do that. But that wiki is so valuable, I cannot tell you. Um, you know, again, take advantage of your Ancestry Library edition or set up that guest account. These are the two most common search portals and, and they guide you quite a bit and give you historical information. So I think for the beginner, this is the best place to start. Um, but then little by little, you can branch out into specific portals uh, based on what you find. But I think, you know, also in general, the, the, the advice usually is to sort of start broad and, and narrow down. Uh, because if you start really narrow on your searches, you'll miss other potential opportunities to learn something else. And that's especially true if you have a name that gets spelled a lot of different ways. Uh, but I would say, yeah, for the beginner, number one, figure out where your, where your questions are. Get those down for yourself first and don't just randomly sit down and start searching. You will waste a lot of time doing that. Hope I answered that <laughs> efficiently. Right, I don't see any more questions, so I think we can go ahead and, and end it there. Is there anything you would like to close with, Carla? Um, not that I can think of, other than it, it, like I said, it this was a whirlwind tour. I realized that, uh, and there there are a lot more deeper dives to go into. But again, like I said in the beginning, um, don't rush out to use a specific technology just because you heard cool things about it. Uh, if the learning curve is gonna take away so much of your time, you're not actually gonna get your research done. So pick the tool that actually serves the task and keeps you on track. 
Alrighty, again, thank you so much for for talking to our our, our patrons today. We we greatly appreciate it, um, and thank you for for anybody uh, attending today. Um, and as I said, this program is being recorded, and this will be available. The recording link, as well as the handout, will be available in a follow up email. Um, and I encourage you to go check out uh, Carla's site um, or attend one of her classes if you want a deeper dive um, and some more information. So, um, again, thank you to everybody and be safe, be well, and hopefully, we'll see you soon. Thank you very much.